Welcome to the Delling Pod. And I am, I know I always say this, but I really am excited about this particular episode. I have managed to track down, I had to come to Madrid to do it. I have managed to track down Dr. Will Happer, who is undoubtedly one of the world's greatest physicists. And he is also a climate skeptic, which means I love him very much. And I'm really excited to finally, <laughs> so good to Thank meet you. you. Um, tell me a bit about, your 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 scientific career, so we can establish you uh, as a, as, a, as a great thinker of our times. I mean, what, you uh, worked on American weapons programs, which you probably can't talk very much about. Some, yes, and um, I've, I've worked a lot on, uh, in particular, high energy lasers and how they propagate in the atmosphere. And so I know a lot about the interaction of radiation and uh, our Earth's atmosphere. When you say a high energy laser. Do you mean like lasers that can shoot down spacecraft and things? Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. Are they used in the military at all these days? I mean, No, no. They were just a kind of a, a, a thing you worked on as a... I've worked on them, you know, there, there have been developments, uh, experimental lasers that would be a real threat. They've never been fielded, at least by the United States, but uh, who knows, they might be someday. Well, well, well um, what would, what could you imagine them being used for? I mean, I'm thinking Star Wars, things like that. I'm thinking if, because there's going to come a time, isn't there, where the, where, the war for territory is going to move to space, China, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Would that would that be a? Yes, uh, an, another place where they, conceivably, could be used would be, uh, you take a country like Israel, which is surrounded with, uh, lots and lots of rockets. You yeah. can't afford to try and shoot them down with, uh, uh, you know, anti-rocket rockets. The anti-rockets are expensive themselves. Yeah. And so it might be a cost-effective way to get defense under the right conditions. Yeah. You have to pray that it's not a cloudy day, right? So there are obvious problems with... That is a problem, later. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So like, uh, you really spotted a flaw in the, in yeah. the, in the, in the laser thing. Um, was that the same with Star Wars? You know, as in the yes, pre yes. As, as President Reagan's initiative. That, that's right. That's that's really how I came to uh, attention of uh, the Washington community was in the early days of Star Wars when they were working on these lasers. They recognized that even if you had a very powerful laser on the ground and aimed it at a incoming uh, warhead, by the time the laser energy got to the warhead instead of being focused on the warhead it would be split up into hundreds of little speckles not, not none of them having enough power to do any damage yeah and that's because the atmosphere is full of little packets of slightly warmer and cooler air that are turbulently mixed it's the same thing that makes stars twinkle at night you look at a star it's not steady it's twinkling it's because right. of this turbulence I'm that's learning so much already, yeah, Carol. That's right. So I, I, it was known that there was this problem, and it was also known that in astronomy you could solve the problem by looking at a dim star that was close to a very bright one, and you would use the light from the bright star to measure the atmospheric turbulence, and then you could distort the laser mirror or the astronomical telescope mirror in sort of the anti-turbulence way so that the light would actually focus perfectly, but you had to be able to measure it. And so if the opponent were kind enough to attack us at night in the direction of a bright star, we, we could get them, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, be... you know, most of the time, you know, he's coming from some other direction. There are yeah. not many bright stars. So the idea I came up was to make an artificial star using a ground-based laser. So I invented what they call the uh, uh, sodium guide star. And so that was very, very secret for many years. And, but it worked the first time they turned it on. And so that gave me some credibility in the uh, defense uh, parts of the government. You yeah, know, it was uh, classified credibility. So I was invited to come to Washington and head the uh, Department of Energy's uh, basic research, which I did for three years under Mr. Bush uh, Sr., mm -hmm. uh, under Admiral Watkins, and then for a, a while under his successor, Sir uh, Hazel O'Leary. I liked them both. They were good people. Uh, 
And then I was eventually fired by Mr. Gore for being, uh, you know, too picky about, you know, scientific accuracy <laughs> on climate. That is, a, yeah. that is a claim to fame in itself, isn't it? I mean, that's a badge of honor. Fired by, by Vice well, President he, he did Gore. me a favor, and he did Barbara, my wife, a favor. She was anxious to have me come home. And uh, so my wife's a big fan of Al, and I, I'm sort of grateful to him also. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. So how, how did he fire you? Did he fire you in person? Were you important enough to be called into an, an office? Or? No, I, I didn't get that honor, but he did uh, instruct my boss, Hazel, who was the Secretary of Energy, uh, who, you know, I kind of liked and yeah. vice versa. She called me into her office after several months of yeah. the new administration, said, well, what have you done to Al Gore? I said, I haven't done anything to him. <laughs> so that was sort of the nature of the conversation. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But, so you must have, you must so have known she, him. So she was told in no uncertain terms, get me out of there. Get, get rid of Happer. Yeah. Well, but, but so you, you say that you'd, you'd <laughs> question his, what, his scientific understanding or what? What have you done to annoy him? Well, uh, uh, Climate in particular. Oh, oh so yeah. you were already... Back even in 1990, you know, he was pushing climate. Right. And, uh, and ozone and, uh, you know, all of these environmental things, which every one of which he exaggerated just grotesquely. See. And, uh, so you were, you were inconvenient, basically. You were an inconvenient right. scientific voice. That's right, yeah. And do you, did you ever get any sense of why Al got so behind this thing? I mean, do you think it's... Is it a cynical money-making scam? Is it political power grab? Or does he believe it? You know, I've asked myself that question many times. I've, I've met him once or twice, and um, I still don't know what the answer is. It's been very profitable for him, so he's a very wealthy Hugely man Hugely profitable. Yeah, yeah. And had you got on the right side, or rather the wrong side, I mean, you joined Al, you, you'd probably be a lot richer now. Oh, yeah, you'd... that's right. Yeah, I've given up a lot to uh, oppose it, yeah. So when did you first spot this scam i mean it is a scam isn't it w it's a scam yeah when, when when did you sort of see it coming when was the first moment where you thought aye aye well well when i was director of energy research because i was funding a lot of it and so i uh would have people come into my office in washington once a week and tell me about the research they were doing that we were supporting uh, you know i felt i ought to know how we were spending the taxpayers' yep. money, and I had a big budget. It was three and a half billion dollars when a billion dollars was worth a lot back yeah. then. <laughs> it's still worth something. But uh, most people were just delighted to come and tell a bureaucrat what they were doing. They, they were very surprised and flattered to be invited. Mm. But the uh, exception was people in climate were always uh, very defensive. Why do you want me to come to Washington? Well, we invite everybody to come to Washington to tell us about their research. Yeah. And uh, they would say, well, uh, you know, we w work for Mr. Gore. And uh, oh. I would... <laughs> it was like that, So that it? was when I began to realize that, you know, there, there's something funny about this area of science. <laughs> so it was kind yeah. of, it was sort of supposed to be off the books or semi off the books. Yeah, yeah. All right. And <laughs> they, they would eventually reluctantly come because I would have my chief of staff point out in the contract that if they didn't come when called that their, their contract would not be renewed right so that got their attention and they would show up but it would be very painful seminar not like normal seminars you know very like playing poker well uh, why do you i'd ask them a question well why are you asking the question i say I always ask questions you know that's the only way to learn and well, one of them had the nerve to say, well, what answer would you like? <laughs> right. So it was, like, it was like a sort of a tutorial. I mean, I don't know what you call them in America, where, where you've got your students who are supposed to have done their homework and really right. have done a very poor job. And you that's right. That's right. And uh, it, it just stood out so much from the other branches of science. You know, people would come in and tell me, we were supporting the Human Genome Project. And... They just couldn't wait to come to Washington and tell me about the latest gene sequencing machine and how well it was doing and how cheap it was and ju just thrilled. And it would be the same with the high energy physicists, how they were doing with the search for the top quark and how close they had come. And uh, everyone else was so happy to come and talk about their work because they were pleased in what they were doing. They thought it was important. and. Uh, 
And so I wonder why, why don't the cl climate scientist people feel the same way? Yeah. <laughs> Physicists yeah. seem to be generally quite skeptical, is that, is that fair? I mean, because, because physics is quite a high-end science, isn't it? It's yeah, quite that, pure. That, that's right. I think there are more skeptics from physics than any other field. Because yeah. Dick Linson. Yes is very, very scathing yes, about yes. The, the scientific abilities of people, in the, particularly in the climate science yes, field. He thinks yes. it's almost like a non-area. Is that fair? Well, he's pretty sour on some of <laughs> the climate people, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. He, I, I think he's sort of, he was suggesting in, in one talk he gave that I saw, that if you're really, really not very talented, then science, climate science is the area you gravitate towards. Well, yes, and, and he's right, because there's so much money there that uh, if you're willing to do so-called research that reinforces the narrative, you can get all the money you like, and then you rise rapidly within your university because the university shares some of this through the overhead, and so you're protected and uh, for example, one of the uh, chief authors of the disgraceful National Climate Assessment uh, that came out last year. Oh, that came out during the, the during Trump administration? During the Trump administration yes. uh, was uh, in an atmospheric physics uh, department and very, very successful in bringing in money, but uh, did essentially no uh, real research, I won't say the name, right, yeah, you know, yeah, not yeah. to embarrass the person, okay. but, but in the end when it came time for a tenure decision, this was a junior person, the, the department voted against tenure for this assistant professor and the administration was so upset at the amount of overhead they were going to lose that they arranged for this climate person to get tenure in the politics department and so the money is still flowing in on supposedly climate research, but it's going to the politics department. <laughs> probably, probably more appropriate. Maybe more appropriate. Climate science yeah. is really about yeah. politics, isn't yeah, it? That's, I think it's mostly politics, yeah. yeah. So a few years ago, I, I read a book called Watermelons, and I, I didn't really know much about the history of science or anything, or the scientific method. Mm. But it became fairly clear to me that one of the fundamental problems with this climate change scam is that the people in, the, in this, these particular fields are really not paying respect to the scientific method at all. I mean, oh, reproducibility. Right. That's right. Um, what, are the, what are the other things you'd expect in the scientific method? I mean... Well, so self-criticism. There's very yes. little self-criticism. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yes, it, it's really tragic, and uh, it's ruined what's very interesting field, you know, after all, climate is important. It's had an enormous impact on humanity throughout history. And uh, the better we understand it, you know, the better it is for us. And yeah. to uh, have had it so uh, uh, distorted and uh, by all of this money on you know, show me that climate is a crisis that has to be addressed by political action right away. Uh, so that means that th the field has been set back for you know, decades, that's the point that uh, Dick Linton makes. I think he's right. Yes, that, that's another area of the scientific method yeah, you've just yeah. reminded me of. That your mind should be blank. I mean, when Röntgen discovered x-rays, he was, he was working on something else, I think, wasn't that's he? That's exactly right, yeah. And you don't, um, you just go where the, where the evidence takes you rather right. than deciding what the right. conclusion is. Right, for example, you know, uh, it's quite clear now that the models are predicting far too much warming. Everyone knows that, even the climate scientists. Uh, and uh, so for normal science, what you would do then is say, okay, what's wrong with the models? Let me go through my assumptions one by one and see which one might be wrong. Yeah. So rather than doing that, though, the community is busy trying to fudge the data. You know, well, it's not agreeing with the model. There must be something wrong with the data. Yeah. Well, that's a terrible sign. It, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's, 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 it's not science, isn't it? Have you heard, by the way, you mentioned normal science. Yeah. Have you heard of this concept of post-normal science? I have, yes. Do you um, want to give me your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, well, I, I, it, it reminds me a little bit of a remark made by uh, 
uh, a colleague at Princeton, uh, John Nash, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, uh, inventing uh, game theory yeah. and um, in economics. And uh, you probably know the story. There was a movie made of him called Beautiful, a Mind. Be Beautiful Mind. And uh, so he was sort of a friend of mine. Yeah. And uh, he was schizophrenic, as it came through in the movie. But he just gradually got better and better. By the time I got to know him in the 80s and 90s, he was almost normal. And so when the Swedish Academy decided that um, well, maybe he, he deserves the prize more than most. Uh, let, let's give him the prize. They were a little nervous that if they gave him the prize and it turned out that they'd given the prize to this raving lunatic, that it would make them look bad. So yeah. they sent a team over to talk to his friends. And uh, so I talked to someone from Sweden about John Nash and said, well, yeah, he looks completely saying to me, I don't think he will embarrass you. No, he'll say what he thinks, but it won't be, it won't sound crazy. Yeah. So on the day he got the prize, uh, of course, there was lots of publicity and uh, he was standing there in his office and there was a reporter, young woman, a little bit like you, and she had a mic and she sticking it in his mouth and she says, uh, oh, Dr. Nash, Dr. Nash, what did you think when you heard and you learned you'd won the prize? And he looks at her and he says, I thought it was more money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I like to, he sounds a... Uh, it's perfectly rational, but not, no, most people wouldn't quite have said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was not, I didn't think it was embarrassing at all. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think, do you think that the world of science has changed for the worse since but it, the, I, I, I didn't finish yes. the, the reason I bring that yeah. up was her second question is uh, Dr. Nash what do you think about the social sciences and he looks at her and he says if the discipline has the word science in it it's not science <laughs> I'm with you yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. do you think um, that um, science there was a, back in the day, mm. scientists were these kind of respected figures. Yeah. We, th we thought they were seekers after truth, um, in their in their white lab coats or whatever, and, um, and yeah. they got Nobel prizes and stuff. Yeah, is, is it still? Has it been corrupted by this kind of new climate? Do you think, or is it only that, that branch of climate science that's? Well, I think uh, scientists have benefited by a. Uh, an aura uh, that is not entire has never been entirely uh, deserved you know yeah. they've always been human beings with foibles and you know uh, personal enemies and uh, so I, I think a lot of the uh, respect they got was uh, not fully warranted yeah but I, th I think it's gotten a lot worse uh, because of government funding you know because uh, they've managed to uh, distort whole fields like science has been uh, climate science has been badly distorted I think yeah and, but that's happened before for example we had we had the um, eugenics movement in the early 1900s which was very popular in your country and in mine too and in, in the Don't United blame States. Me. <laughs> and uh, it was yeah. uh, it wasn't science at all you know it was ideology disguised as science and they would give these you know, doctor tests to try to make, uh, you know, Chinese and Japanese and Eastern Europeans look, you know, subhuman compared to the good old Anglo-Saxon race, you know. It was just complete nonsense. And yet, yeah. lots and lots of people signed up to it, you know. There were eugenic societies in every town and... Oh, yeah, it was very fashionable, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I think right, George yeah. Bernard Shaw and the people like that were that, that's embraced right. it. Yeah, the presidents of Harvard and Stanford and Princeton were all big eugenicists. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it, it was not true. It was just phony. Possibly one day this fad could pass. Yeah, the, the the discouraging thing is the thing that made it pass so quickly was it, its excess use in Nazi Germany. Right. And so I hope we don't need that to get rid of uh, the phoniness of climate. You know. There is something of the totalitarian state, yeah. isn't there, about the climate science? You think about, um, uh, well, Lysenkoism is quite similar, right, I think. Very too. similar, yeah. It was driven by ideology because uh, if you could 
change wheat characteristics so it would grow in Siberia or near the Arctic Circle or apples. Uh, you could do the same things to humans. And so if you educate them properly in, in the Komsomol and the young pioneers, they will have children who will be born as communists, you know, and the society will get better and better and better. You ah, know? So, uh, is that the idea? That was part of the idea. Right, yeah. I see. Well, you, you, you were, you were um, at Princeton, presumably, at the height of the Cold War. I mean, when, it, when, when communism really was a, yeah. an issue. Yeah. Um, and now, in a way, do you not think, I sometimes worry that, that environmentalism is, is the, new, the new sort of communist threat. It's the new threat to freedom and, and intellectual integrity yeah. and lots of other things. Well, it's a mix. There are certainly parts of the environmental movement that are very totalitarian and then they're sincere people. I mean, I consider myself, and you probably do too, an environmental littlest. We, I mean, we, yeah, we love nature. We'd like it beautiful and pristine and clean for our children and grandchildren. Yeah. So uh, environmentalist is, is too broad a term. It, co it includes us both. No, well, you asked me how I got into this game, yeah, and yeah. actually what really upset me yeah, yeah. was seeing beautiful countryside despoiled by these, what I call, bat-chomping, bird-slicing eco-crucifixes. Right. That's right, I yeah. mean, How can you love nature and blight it with these monstrosities? Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, you can love it because what you really love is the income from your windmill and, and the subsidies. And so <laughs> yes. you disguise this by saying that you love nature, you know, but... Uh, so you were, you were called back in, back in from the cold by the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. um, what, what happened? Did you get a nice letter? Did you get a phone call or...? Yeah, some people called me from the National Security Council and uh, asked if I would consider coming down and uh, come by and chat. So I did and we talked and I, they said, well, we have all these technical problems that we need some help on. Uh, EMP, electromagnetic pulse, and uh, other technical issues. And uh, I said, what about climate? Well, you know, we prefer not to touch that. I said, well, if you'll let me touch it myself and try and do something, I'll come and help you with the other things. And so they said, OK, it's a deal. So that's why I came. <laughs> oh, so it was a quid pro quo. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's right. And what, what is EMP? What, 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 what were the problems they were having with it that need solving? Well, for example, there's this uh, perennial problem of electromagnetic magnetic pulses that, uh, for example, every now and then we get caught in a big solar storm and uh, that can burn out large parts of the power grid. One of the worst uh, was back in the 1800s when telegraph lines were first put in and uh, the storm was so bad it was described by an Englishman named Carrington but it actually set, you know, telegraph booths on fire, you know, things were arcing from this storm. Oh. And we've had smaller ones since, and so you should design grids so that they can be protected against that. And um, so the Trump administration decided to finally force the U.S. power industry to put in protections. And so I was supposed to help make that happen because I understood the physics. Okay. And it was also, you can do that artificially with a nuclear weapon. And so I knew about the nuclear weapon effects yeah. and I was able to help that way too. Yeah. So that was the, sort of the main reasons I was called down to try and help with that. And did, and did you solve it? Well, I think we made progress. I think things, you know, it takes a You're long time modest, to solve that. Yeah. Basically, yeah. you save the entire American grid from no, the next. No, I thank you, but I, I, we're 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 getting there. <laughs> good. That's good. Yeah. And in return, you 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 wanted to use your influence. I mean, I. I've been. I got really excited when Trump came to the White House. I thought this yeah. is going to be game over for the for the eco loons yeah. and and stuff. Game over for the climate industrial complex. But I, re it seems to be quite schizoid the uh, the White House in terms of seem to be different factions. Some of which yeah. are obviously true believers in the great climate scam. That's right. There are a few true believers. There are uh, some opportunists who. Uh, and then there are these political realists, real politic types who are worried about votes. And uh, so there are very few who really want to take this on. Uh, Mr. Trump is one of the exceptions. I think he would be delighted to take it on if he were given free reign, but his advisors 
are not isn't that, isn't that so, uh, yeah. isn't that an exciting thought yeah. president trump unleashed <laughs> <laughs> i mean <he's, laughs> Well, he's sort of. Oh, but I'd love to see he's that. He's sort of unpredictable, and uh, <laughs> yeah, he's that. But I, I, I wish. To, I mean, so you, you, do you? You have sort of like chats one to one with him in the in the White House. You know, you went yes, to the yes, 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 and you know, he he was enthusiastic. And we, we've had several. We had several discussions, but after every meeting, his advisors would. Uh, come back with counter arguments about why this was such a terrible idea and and uh, you know this dragged out the process month after month and and so eventually it was obvious that it was time to begin the re-election campaign right and at that point it was too late to take it I, I see that yeah. I imagine what you were hoping for was something on the lines of this the red team blue team yes. thing that I discussed yes. where you'd get well how would that work exactly well, on other major systems, for example, in the Defense Department, if there's a big new weapon system, you bring in the experts uh, on this particular technology and you have them try and shoot it down. Or, for example, you're designing a new nuclear weapon you, and the lead is taken by Los Alamos, you bring in hostile peers from Livermore who did their very best to show that this is a piece of junk, it will never work. And yeah. sometimes they found uh, evidence it really is a piece of junk. And yeah. if, if they can't, then you can be very reassured that, may, okay, this is probably going to be a good investment. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very good process. It works like a charm. It saved us, you know, billions of dollars in other areas. And yet here's this area which is going to cost many trillions and we're unable to do it. For, for climate. Because we don't even discuss it. That's, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. So it, it's really bizarre. You know, and, uh, Did you find, what, when you were talking to President Trump, that, that he was very quick to, to understand the points you were he making? He understood it, yeah. He didn't need me to tell him that. Right, that's interesting. Yeah. And he, he had already gone through the same arguments on pulling out of Paris. You know, he, there was enormous uh, opposition to that within the White House and across Washington and, and the Republican Party, not just the Democrat. And, uh, That's frightening, isn't it? Yeah. There are quite a lot of kind of rhino squishes. Yeah, are, well, <laughs> whatever you call them. Whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. But, but to his credit, you know, he was as good as his word and pulled out. How do you, so why do you think he got away with that? What, what, was, what gave him the, the courage or the independence to make that tough decision? Well, I think he thought it was the right thing to do for America. You know, I, I felt I was a little disappointed that he w didn't stress how crazy the science was. So his arguments were that it's a terribly unfair deal to America. So he was not willing to articulate the fact that it's based on nonsense, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's why a really br good blue ribbon committee, you know, red team, would uh, provide the kind of ammunition that he needed for that. So, in a nutshell, how, because now I've got you, I, I want you to kind of explain to my, not, not that I have many, um, <laughs> many climate alarmists among my, my listenership, but suppose there's somebody listening and they're worried about climate change, they think it's, a, they think it's the big issue of the time, what, what would you say to them to persuade them otherwise? Well, I would ask them to try and look at some of the uh, counter evidence. For example, we have this little group called the CO2 Coalition, and there are several little white papers there that lay out the arguments without equations, but clearly. And so they should read uh, sort of responsible uh, criticism of this. And uh, uh, so one of, one of the CO2 Coalition white papers is, uh, think for yourself, you know, it's a white paper, and uh, people have a hard time thinking for themselves. So if you think for yourself, most people I know who think for themselves when they start digging into this, they come over to our side. Yeah. Yeah. But CO2 is, I mean, is it any way dangerous? Is it, is it? Of course not. I mean, you, you and I are sitting here breathing out <laughs> huge amounts of CO2, and, you know, our lungs have got... 40, 50,000 parts per million CO2 compared to only 400 out in the air. So 
and it, it's uh, absolutely essential. You know, the reason you get sick from hyperventilating is because you have too little CO2 in your body, right? So CO2 is essential for proper functioning of, of animals, and uh, breathing reflex is uh, controlled by CO2. You know, if you have too little CO2, uh, then you stop breathing, you know, and, and you can die. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so, so CO2, and it's very, very good for plants. It's, it's almost never been at low levels the way it is today over geological history. So, so we're, we're in historic We're life. in a famine with respect to CO2. So the idea that adding CO2 is in some way harmful, it's just baffling. You know, if you look at the science, it's not at all harmful. It's actually good for the world. And am I right in thinking, I sometimes say this yeah. very confidently, but there is no evidence, is there, other than computer models, that CO2 is driving catastrophic climate change. There's no evidence at all no, anywhere. No, I mean, even, even the measured climate change, you know, climate always changes, but the, the rates of warming are a third of what was predicted by the first IPCC models, and no one how, knows how much of that one third is still natural because we're coming out of an ice age, a uh, little ice age, I should say, that ended around 1800. Uh, and you can see that very, very clearly where there are glaciers, because glaciers started to recede around 1800, 1790. It's very striking in Alaska, where many of the coastal glaciers were charted by Vancouver, in particular Glacier Bay. So if you ever get a chance to visit Glacier Bay, you'll learn a lot about climate just looking oh, okay. at, right. at how the ice has receded. But the, the ice began to melt uh, by 1790, and by, by 1880, most of the ice in that bay was gone. The entire glacier was gone, and there was n almost no increase in CO2 by 1880, you know. So it has been warming, but the warming began long before there was any increase in CO2, and we don't know how much of the current warming is still part of that natural, you know, rebound from the Little Ice Age. Do we even know how much anthropogenic CO2 is contributing to climate change? I mean, well, you can estimate it. You know, most people, uh, and I, I'm in that camp, feel that it, it's on the order of uh, one degree centigrade warming if you double CO2. It might be 1.3, might be 0.8, you know, but of that order. But the, that's not enough to worry people very much. And so they've invented all of these positive feedback mechanisms that a yes. little direct warming from CO2 will be greatly amplified. And the villain is supposed to be water, vapor, and, and clouds. But there's no real good evidence that that's happening. In fact, there's a lot of counter evidence that's probably not happening. Right. Yeah. Well, I I feel that I feel that, you, that you've covered that subject yeah. nicely now. I, I I can't imagine anyone listening to this podcast <laughs> will ever again think that CO two is the primary driver of of climate change. <laughs> <laughs>